Not many people get the absolute pleasure of recording a podcast with their best friend, but luckily I had that this week. No, Marvin's not here. I don't know where he's at. I think he's recovering from a 5K. Jenny's off on a cruise for somebody. Keenan's back home, and Nicole's asleep. So I get my real best friend. She's an eight-pound tabby, and she's here to talk some stuff with me because we're back, back again. Yes, we're back. Tell a friend. It's the Ramblin' Men. Thank you for tuning in this week. Me and Clementine are going to sit here and talk for a little while. Might be a short episode, but I always say that, and then it ends up going on for a while. I'll have a cute little head to scratch, and she can sleep on the keyboard. But yeah, man, welcome to the Ramble On. I'm your host. You know me by this point, if you have been listening. If not, welcome to the Ramble On. My name's Kevin. I gab, talk, discuss, make an ass of myself most of the time. This week I'm making an ass of myself with some nice... Irish liqueur brought to you by Michaels. No, they're not a sponsor, but god damn it, are they delicious. <sighs> delicious. Got a few things to discuss. No, I'm not really going to talk about the Oscars. Eh, we'll talk about it real quick. A few movies, hidden gems that we uh, that I found this week that I think a lot of people should check out just simply because they're good and worth worth watching. So many opportunities to find things with the way that action movies and tentpole films get pushed in our throats. Can we find something that's worth watching? So, man, I gotta tell you, there's just not much coming out in 2016 yet that's getting me too excited. The new uh, Shane Black movie with Ryan Gosling and Russell Crowe, that, that looks like a good time. It'll be out in May, but I still gotta wait for that. You know, and the reason I think I bring this up mostly is because of the new Ghostbusters trailer that popped out with our, you know, four comedians directed by uh, a talented director, Paul Feig. But the way that the backlash on the internet is hitting, it's just kind of, even outside of reading about or hearing about what people don't like, it just doesn't seem to click for some reason. Uh, Except for Kate McKinnon, if anybody knows her from Saturday Night Live. She's fantastic. She nails it. And in the trailer, it seems like she's going to be worth checking out. But at the same time, I wait a couple months and I can check her little skits out on YouTube and get just as much of enjoyment if I spent 15 bucks. In general, folks, I'm kind of moving on from the nostalgia kick. I know Marvin's all excited about it. He has his shows and movies that he gets excited about because they feed into his... Nostalgia. I guess it's something that happens when you, you're you over 30. Or maybe it's just he's desperate for something familiar. I don't know. He can't defend himself, so... He's also not going to listen to this episode. Seems to be a continuing trend every uh, episode of the Ramble On. I need to remind people that my co-host does not listen to the show. Are you done? Already? We just got here. You want to leave already? We just got here. I've already lost my co-host, so <clears throat> now you just got me. Anyways, nostalgia, nostalgia aside, um, not impressed so far with the Ghostbusters, but we'll see. Maybe when it comes out, it won't be too bad, but you never know. You know, speaking of nostalgia, I, uh, and a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be discussing today are Netflix specials, um, or things that you can find on Netflix. One of them, I think, that everyone was all amped up for, for all the obvious reasons, was the Fuller House show. Naturally, being kids of the 90s like Nicole and myself were, we really wanted to check it out, see what it is, and you want to talk about a corn fest, make me some corn balls, just be careful of the machine, you'll burn your hands. Take those corn balls out and just cover them in shredded cheese, because son of a bitch is that show... Cornball Cheesy, which goes without saying, the full, the original show was very much in the same vein as, as, the, uh, as the sequel series, but boy howdy, those kids are uh, rough. The girls are pretty good, just shows kid actors aren't that great, and it's hard, it's hard to watch a movie like Room with an incredibly talented young man and Jacob Tremblay and then watch a, uh, you know, a cheese fest like Fuller House, but that's kind of being incredibly unfair. 
It's like comparing Transformers to Ben-Hur. One action movie is perfect action movie, and another one is a complete mess. So, am I being fair? Nope. Am I going to make the comparison anyway? Yup. Because I know no better, and I'm a bad person to make fun of kids who can't act. Could I do better? Probably not. Although, that would be interesting to see a 28-year-old man play the part of a 7-year-old. If you've listened to this podcast, you'd probably understand that it would actually be perfect casting. But, and I would cost less. You know, baby insurance and all. It'd save a lot of money. I'd do it for free, honestly. It's all about making connections, people. Which I have none. So, if somebody wants to forward this podcast to somebody, uh, that would really help me out. So, yeah, if uh, you have... What is it, seven hours, six and a half hours or something that you want to throw away on a fuller house? Have a good time. Or not, I don't know. If you're feeling that buzz and nostalgia and you need to watch something. Well, actually, there's, you know, as I recommended in the last episode, you can watch Young Justice. That deals with teenage angst. That's a better show. Or anything else. I mean, honestly, you can rewatch Breaking Bad. Last Man Standing, the Tim Allen show, that's on Netflix. Eh, that kind of falls in the same realm, but... Eh, I don't know. There's better stuff. Watch whatever you want. I, you know... I don't think anybody really takes my opinion seriously anyway. Hey, if you take my opinion seriously, comment below. Or uh, Face Machine or Twitbox. Let me know what you think over there. If you want to, it doesn't matter. I'm going to keep talking to myself. Or the cat who is now fast asleep or something behind a reusable grocery bag. But another show that's uh, just dropped on Netflix this month, this past month, I should say, um, in February is the new Judd Apatow produced show, Love. I've only watched the first episode. It looks interesting. Paul Fu- Paul Fust and or whatever his name is Paul Rust Fust, some Jewish guy, uh, and Gillian Jacobs from Community play uh, two troubled uh, millennials in L.A. having trouble with love. Hey, it's in the title. How about that? I like Gillian Jacobs. She's fine, or she's the worst. I can never remember watching Community if she's great or terrible, but I'm gonna go with. Fine, I guess, but no, she's uh, she's fun. I, I've I liked her on Community and even in uh, little movies that I've caught her in, um, she's been generally enjoyable. So this other guy, I have no idea. He is looks like a lot of the other neurotic Jewish characters that Judd Apatow throws in his movies. So um, if you've seen him once, you've seen them all. So we'll see how this show goes as I get more into it. But I have uh, I enjoyed the first episode. Um, I saw people online kind of comparing it to You're the Worst, which I have mentioned several times on the show. Um, it didn't have the same ultimate click of You're the Worst, but, you know, after 10, 13 episodes, however many it is, we'll see how I feel then. But I don't know, maybe I'll swing into the Oscars real quick. I mean, you know, they happened last week. I didn't watch them. Kind of followed them while I was at, I was working um, that night, working the nice little concert hall. And... All I can say about it, and, you know, I know everybody's everybody's talking about Chris Rock and his opening opening segment and kind of his jokes throughout about black people not getting their, their fair shake, which I brought up before, man. I think everybody's been bringing it up for years now. He did make a good point in his opening monologue about no one gave a shit back in the 60s when you were lucky if Poitier didn't make a movie. Because Grandma was swinging from the tree, they didn't have time to worry about who was getting nominated at the Oscars. I think the measuring stick being the Academy Awards, I think that shit just needs to go away, man. You just, it's all predictable, you know. It's all a bunch of bullshit anyway, so who cares. By the way, did you know that a Mexican won the Academy Award for Best Director three years in a row? And Cinematographer, so... You know, black people might not be getting a fair shake, but the Hispanics seem to be doing just fine. But, by the way, uh, one of those guys was 
uh, back to back, which hasn't happened in years, by the way. Um, Alejandro Inarritu for The Revenant took home his second in a row. Third for a Mexican-born director, Alfonso Cuarón, won a few years ago for Gravity. So that's pretty cool. Keeping it up for our Hispanic brethren down south. Come on over. Donald Trump isn't president yet. We'll take you in just fine. And that's why George Bush made it into the White House, because of his good tidings with the Hispanics down here in Texas when he was the governor. So you know what? GW, you're still cool with me, bro. You know, I got to say, uh, the way that the Oscars kind of fell into place was pretty much, you know, if anybody predicted any other way than what people were predicting two or three months ago before, you know, people start politicking and doing their games, it's it was going to fall the same way that it did. Spotlight was going to win Best best Picture. I think people were saying McCarthy, Tom McCarthy, director, was going to win Best Director, but, you know, that worked out the way that it did, considering just how how much of a technical marvel The Revenant was, a technical marvel, it's kind of pushing it a little bit, just the work that went into that movie compared to Spotlight, which is just a, which is an Oscar bait movie, you know, direction, probably nothing special. But yeah, you know, the acting categories all went the way that people have been calling them for a few months. I know people were upset that Sly Stallone didn't win, but if people had been paying attention, they would have known Mark Rylance was going to win anyway. Homeboy took it home. He was in a Spielberg movie. He was set for success. I never saw Bridge of Spies. It looked boring and tedious. You know, I have an associate's degree in history. I don't know why I brought that up. Leo DiCaprio won, finally. Now the internet can shut the fuck up. You know, I generally enjoy Leo DiCaprio. I think he's a talented guy. He seems like a nice guy. Down-to-earth cat. He is definitely down with the earth, I will say that. Leo got it. I saw The Revenant twice. While I do believe that he did a good job, I don't think he did the best job of the year. It's just kind of a, at that point, it was just kind of a, a pity award, I think. Definitely, he gave a lot to it. But I don't think enough to be like, yeah, that is that. You know what I'm saying? Michael Fassbender, I thought of Steve Jobs, put on a better overall performance than Leo. People might argue about it for a while. I don't know, man, but I just I just believe that it just wasn't the best Leo performance. And we could have got better. Alicia Vikander, she came on hard, late. The transgender community is a hot topic, a button issue. Um, you know, the success of Transparent and, uh, you know, Caitlyn Jenner with, with her coming out and everything. Obviously, people um, are discussing it quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> so Alicia Vikander apparently was the best part of that movie. I, the, the trailer did its bit, but it's a Tom Hooper movie. The guy's done Les Mis. He did The King's Speech. The guy only does Oscar bait movies. It seems to be a British thing. You know, it just, I don't know. The guy seems kind of, kind of cold, I guess. I don't know. The guy just seems very uptight and into himself. Maybe I'm not over the fact that he beat uh, Dave Fincher, best director for Social Network. I still think that was a bunch of bullshit, but I digress. Anyways, it's nice that she won the award. She won the award for the wrong movie. There's no doubt in my mind that she should have got it for Ex Machina which did take home an Academy Award for Special Effects, which is awesome. That movie is fantastic and deserves all the love that it got. It deserved more. If there's a way that we could retroactively change it on, I wish you talk to the people at IMDB, just really fuck with people, and change the movie next to the Condor's name to Ex Machina. I don't know. I just think that'd be funny. I only saw, I mean, I saw Hateful Eight, I saw Steve Jobs, I saw Carol, and... Everyone was saying Rooney Mara, and I just, you know, I really like Rooney. I just didn't see anything outstanding. Like, comparatively, Kate Blanchett, I thought, gave a better performance. Kate Winslet, I thought, was good in Steve Jobs. Jennifer Jason Lee was awesome in The Hateful Eight for a movie that I didn't really care about. The Condor just kind of makes sense from the clips that I saw. So, you know, that goes as it does. Best performance by an actress in a leading role. That went to the person that people have been calling, I think, since they first saw clips for Room, or saw the trailer for Room. I don't think anybody was taking down Brie, and for good good reason, the girl took home her statue. 
for those like myself that have been watching her for years from when she was on the United States of Terra and supporting stints in Spectacular Now and Don Joan and things along those lines, people knew how talented she was. It was just waiting for that right movie to come along. Honestly, I think that right came along a couple of years ago in Short Term 12, and I think we've mentioned Short Term 12 before on the show. I just rewatched it this weekend, and it's it's weird to say, but I really think that that is just a perfect movie. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a small scale movie. Destin Daniel Cretton, who wrote and directed it, did a short film based on it, based on his time working in a short term home. It's a movie about a supervisor of a short term residential establishment for young kids who have been displaced because of their parents. They can't, you know, keep them, whatever the reason might be, you know, death, drug problems, the, you know, the state will take the kids and they got to put them somewhere. Brie Larson fucking knocked it out of the park in that movie too. But you look at the list of people that are in that movie, you know, John Gallagher Jr. who's popped up in the newsroom with uh, with Jeff Daniels. And I've watched a good bit of that show and he he's still good, obviously. Rami Malek, Mr. Robot, Golden Globe nominee this year and probably should have won. I don't remember who won, who cares? It's a Golden Globes. Stephanie Beatrice, she plays Rosa on Brooklyn Nine-Nine. She's hilarious. Keith Stanfield and Caitlin Deaver, those two are just awesome. They knock it out of the park in this movie, and they still do. I mean, Keith Stanfield was Selma. He was in um, Straight Outta Compton. You know, he's got he's gonna be in the, he was in Dope. He's in the he's in the new Miles Davis movie directed by Don Cheadle. Don Cheadle's gonna play Miles Davis. It's his directorial debut. So, hey man, I'm a fan of Don oh. Cheadle, so I'm down to see it. Caitlin Deaver. She's popped up on uh, Last Man Standing, Justified. She's been in a few movies. She's a she's a talented kid. Anyways, she's a you know she's got a a nice long career ahead of her for her. So, you know, Short Term Twelve. It's that's a legit ass movie, man. And if you haven't watched it yet, go check that movie out. You know that movie is worth your time. It's on Netflix. It's only it's only an hour and a half long. If you're one of those people that take the time to make an hour and a half to watch a movie, you're not doing too bad with Short Term 12. Just be mindful. It is kind of a sad movie. There's lighter moments, considering where the movie is set and what it involves. It is kind of a it is kind of an intense film to watch, but that doesn't take away from just how from start to finish. It's just a solid, solid movie and definitely worth checking out. So. So yeah, what are you what are you doing? Turn turn off the podcast. I am willing to let you turn it off so that you can watch Short Term Twelve. I might watch it again. It's another one of those movies that I've watched numerous times where a lot of people will try and put it on the you know only watch once list. Uh, Clockwork Orange or Requiem for a Dream or um, you know movies like that where people are like, oh, you, how do you watch that movie more than once? I guess I'm just a sick twisted individual or something my life is so good i'm looking for something to bring it down i don't know something like that it's just an interesting and intricate way of diving into you know young people's psyches that a lot of people just kind of write off you know it's it's one of those things where they just tell them act you know it's one of those get over it kind of situations it's like it's going to take a lot more than that and i think uh Creden definitely pays respect to kids that he's you know obviously worked with in the past so i think it's just uh you know it's a knockout flick man check it out as soon as you can if you've already seen it then you know what i'm talking about if you haven't uh go check it out but you know all that stems from talking about room not the room but room um you know which rightfully won which on imdb it'll say won one oscar should have won more um, after seeing that movie, and I've, I've proclaimed from every high pedestal that I can that my favorite movie of the year for the longest time in 2015 was Inside Out. Well, fortunately, no more, because Room was it, man. That movie is outstanding. Brie Larson was great. Jacob Tremblay was a revelation. Um, you know, I'm, I know I'm using trailer speak. You know, you watch a trailer, and it was... 
it'll say this or that about how great this person is or that person is. I know I'm using trailer speak to talk about Tremblay, but the kid was just unreal good. So, so when you can, it's out on DVD now, so I'm sure you can get it at Redbox here soon or uh, find it somewhere here soon. But, you know, definitely check that flick out. It's a rough one to get through, too. You know, there's no doubt about that. It's a, it's a rough subject material. You know, a young girl gets kidnapped, used as a sexual object. Due to that se sexual object, she has a child. She tries to teach that child about the real world while being stuck in a, a 4x4 or 5x5 room. It's terrifying. It's a terrifying concept. It's a terrifying thought. But Lenny Abramson, who directed Frank with Michael Fassbender, they definitely get it right based on Emma Donahue's books. So, a couple of fine Irish storytellers bringing a real good tale to the masses. Um, I think this movie made more money in its opening Friday, which obviously wasn't much, than Short Term 12 made in its entire run. Fortunately, Netflix picked it up and people are finding it. So, it doesn't matter how new or old a movie is, but if you can find a good movie, find a good movie, man. That's the that's the benefit of the Criterion Collection for pretentious hipsters like myself who want to watch something from, uh, you know, Cassavetes or Fellini or something before they made their big hits, you know. they Finding something really, really, really obscure. Or just watch all the Charlie Chaplin stuff. I mean... The cool thing about Criterion, they have most of Chaplin stuff, which rediscovering that guy was is just unreal. You know, if you've seen the the clip of him from The Great Dictator giving that speech at the end, basically giving a big fuck you to to Hitler right when he was starting to really, really take power, which caused him a lot of strain and grief in Hollywood, which is really weird, but he really started taking it you know, he really started to ramp up his political awareness or his political attitudes, which I, I don't think a lot of people liked, especially from a silent film star. Maybe it's because he was talking. They didn't know what he sounded like, and he starts talking all this crazy political bullshit, and they're like, oh, go make a silent movie. Or just go away. At that point, it's probably just go away. That's probably why he had, like, seven wives. They were expecting the tramp, and what they got was a uh, was a political nut. But ah, Chaplin, that man was something else. Let me tell you. Like I said, Short Term Twelve did did not make a lot of money at the box office, but a category that doesn't get much play at the Academy Awards. And we've kind of done. We've been over the last several episodes. We've kind of brought up independent horror films that not a lot of people talk about. The next movie I want to bring up just real quick, considering Short Term 12 didn't make a lot of money at the box office, it still probably made more money than what this movie was made for, which gives me a lot of, give me some hope that if I ever do pull the trigger and pipe dream that it is, make movies, at least I know that these guys made a really great movie for no money. Um, it's a zombie, post-apocalyptic zombie film called The Battery. The battery is based on these two minor league baseball players that get caught up in the post-apocalypse in Connecticut together. Let me uh, let me just ask real quick for the 12 people that listen to this podcast still. Are you sick of zombie-related things? Okay, all 12 of your hands are up. Don't worry, Jenny doesn't listen to the show, so her hand's not raised. But while I do feel the same way, Everybody hypes up uh, Walking Dead is still the highest rated show on television right now. You know, other zombie flicks come and go, zombie shows come and go. I Zombie is on the CW, uh, Rob Thomas production, which apparently isn't too bad. I don't know, it's just watching something on the CW just, that's why I kind of fell out of Arrow and Flash and I never really watched Flash, let's be serious. But the battery kind of keeps the subtlety to it. I think, you know, everyone talks about The Walking Dead, how the best thing about Walking Dead is the human drama involved in it. Most of the time anymore, it seems like, and this is from what I've been told, this isn't what I know or see. From what people, t from what people say, it just seems like they focus more on the human drama than they do the zombie drama. It's like, you're trying to survive a zombie apocalypse, and you're more having petty squabbles with you know the people you're supposed to be surviving with it's like 
There's bigger things to worry about, folks. You know that you're all doomed anyway. Spoiler alert, if you've never watched The Walking Dead, they're all sick anyway, so who cares? But The Battery, uh, written, directed, and stars Jeremy Gardner and Adam Kronheim, a couple guys who are just slowly but surely making their way through the independent scene in filmmaking. Jeremy Gardner is directing another movie that's coming out later this year called The Mind's Eye. Or no, he's just starring in that, excuse me. Tex Montana Will Survive is his next directed movie. Another festival hit from last year. It'll probably be making its way to uh, Amazon Prime, probably. That's where I found the battery. They made a really interesting look into uh, uh, post-apocalyptic zombie films. I think the one nice thing about the battery is, is that it does, an hour and 40 minutes, what The Walking Dead sometimes can't succeed in six or seven episodes. They allow you the drama between characters while also giving you a chance to uh, to see them survive against these zombies. And the nice thing about the battery is that they allow sequences in the movie to be funny. It never seemed like there was a lot of... And naturally, it's post-apocalypse, so no one's going to have a lot of laughs going. But compared to The Walking Dead, which is just a big drug fat, drudge fest, you know, everyone's got everyone's to be sad and everyone's got to be looking for Carl or whatever. He got his eye popped out, right? Ah, who cares? These guys do have some light moments of banter and comedy, you know, so it keeps it light when otherwise it wouldn't be. You know, you get a chance to laugh before something crazy happens. So yeah, for six thousand dollars, man, they did a lot of they did a lot of good stuff. And I think there's there's even a sequence. They have a big old old school nineteen nineties Volvo wagon that they used to go from point A to point B. And honestly, that sequence was more tense than what I can remember from Walking Dead most of the time. Mostly because they don't portray these guys as superheroes. Like you think about the first was the first or second episode or whatever it was when when Rick got uh got stuck in the tank. Like he still figured out a way out. And he's got 150 zombies that are about to swallow him whole and you know, some way or another, he makes it out alive. No, of course, we wouldn't be here in season who gives a shit uh, with Rick still as the leader of the group. But yeah, it just, it, it kind of defies reality. The nice thing about the battery is that they're stuck in that Volvo with 50 zombies slamming on the glass and trying to bust through the uh, bust through the car. Situation being what it is, I, I recommend to watch it to kind of see how it all plays out. But, but you just kind of sit there and after a while you kind of get worn out like they do like they get frustrated and they just decide you know what screw this man let's just let's just see how it goes and even going into it you know there's no there's no way out of it possibly that's not it's kind of a spoiler but not necessarily a spoiler but it's still a a a pretty cool sequence to watch so the battery starring jeremy gardner and adam kronheim now on amazon prime well that kind of rhymed I'm going to do this for the rest of the show, I I mind. Do you mind? Ah, whatever. That's going to be hard. I've already run out of words. But no, the battery is is definitely worth checking out. It's one of, uh, just assume, uh, everything that we talk about today, or everything that Clementine and I talk about today. She came back, by the way. Every time, everything that the two of us discuss today is nice little old Kevin Stamp of approval but from one horror genre film to the other talk about zombies let's talk about vampires not necessarily filmed in iran but uh one that's supposed to be based in iran if you don't mind subtitles for an hour and a half a movie that came out this past year 2000 we're released in 2015 one that kind of snuck under the radar one that's been on Netflix for a while, so definitely check it out when you get the chance. Girl Walks Home Alone at Night. Now, this movie is sneakily one of the best horror films of the last 10 years. And horror, I don't know, I, I would compare it to It Follows in regards to horror, where it's more dramatic horror. It's not necessarily about the scares, it's about the sequences and the situations. But even still, 
Man, this movie was awesome. Uh, I know that we're all sick of the sparkly, sprinkly love story vampires. The cool thing about this movie is you get the um, you get you get kind of a love story, but the focus is on this um, this girl that walks home alone at night. You know, and all she she's just called the girl. That's her title. If you've ever watched How I Met Your Mother, Marshall Manesh, who plays Ranjit from How I Met Your Mother, limo cab driver, he uh, he has a role in this movie, and the guy's a talented actor. I mean, he has a pretty impressive filmography. I mean, with uh, this movie and True Lies and The Big Lebowski, I mean, the guy's been around. He's done some quality, quality stuff. So it's not just you know how i met your mother in a somewhat guest appearance but he's got a uh, he's got a pretty impressive resume so he's uh, he's a talented dude and he definitely gets a chance to kind of show that more in uh in this movie we're in bad city it's an iranian ghost town Ooh, spooky you know all the problems that the townspeople have to deal with you got a prostitute you got the the junkie you got a pimp you got you, you got these people that have their own problems, but at the end of the day, you got the girl running around, you know, sniping people off with her vampire teeth. So it's a, I wouldn't necessarily call it a slow moving movie. It does kind of, it does have that indie field kind of trope, you know what I'm saying? Where it takes its time. It doesn't rush through everything. It's not quick cuts and quick edits. It kind of lets you, it lets the characters build the drama with what they're presenting on the screen. Um, Arash Morandi plays Arash, and uh, Sheila Vaughn plays the girl, and they have good chemistry together. I mean, they are the, the quote-unquote love story in the movie, but it's definitely worth checking out. It's, it's in the same vein of vampire movies as Let the Right One In, which is one of Sweden's best exports when it comes to film, and Only Lovers Left Alive, which was Jim Jarmusch's vampire film starring Tilda Swinton and Tom Hiddleston, which another one of my nice little stamp of approval there for Only Lovers Left Alive. Jim Jarmusch makes weird movies. Um, he's just one of those avant-garde kind of directors, but this one is definitely one of his more approachable. And you get... It's the outstanding performances from Swinton and Hiddleston. In the same way in this movie, your two leads give great performances and the supporting cast gives really engaged, interesting performances as well. And you get to see a movie starring, you know, uh, Middle Eastern descent actors and actresses speaking in their native tongue of Persian, which I think is really cool. Anna Lily Amrapour, she's the writer and director. She doesn't have a you know, she mostly, she's mostly done short films and the like, but, you know, she's definitely going to be a, she's definitely going to be a director to be able to look out, especially if, and I think that kind of feeds into, it's nice, there is, and not to say that there aren't more women filmmakers that don't have a voice, but it's nice that one who got the opportunity to, to go through the GoFundMe process to build up enough money to make a movie close to her heart. And she, uh, you know, it definitely came out on screen. She got a great movie out of her cast and the rest of her crew and everything built a really, 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 really good horror film. Horror drama, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, man, this movie, this movie rocked. I was very pleased to uh, take the time to watch this movie. You know, it just, it just feels like anymore. It's, I, I wait until movies come out to check them out. You know, the convenience of it being with dollar theaters down here in San Antonio. I'll have a chance to go to the dollar theater and see Hail Caesar. You know, it's... Especially in a in a podcast kind of world or movie review kind of world, people kind of want to read about new movies more often than not. You know, they want to they wanna know if, uh, you know, Batman Superman is going to be worth seeing. Or they want to know if uh, a lot of these movies coming out are going to... Hey, am I good and with how expensive movie tickets are? They want to know: Am I getting my money's worth of my twelve dollar ticket? Jesus, that's depressing. But sometimes it's it's not about seeing it right then and there, man. You know, it's like if you have to wait until it's out on DVD or freaking out on Dollar Theater, wherever it is, and so be it. There's tons of movies to catch up on. If you have a Netflix subscription, it's about 
kind of finding those hidden gems. They have a page literally called Hidden Gems on Netflix. So, you know, being able to check that out and see what's out there, shit, man. It's all you got to do. Do you seriously want to go see Dirty Grandpa with Zac Efron and Robert De Niro? Or Fifty Shades of Black with uh, Marlon Wayans? No. You want to see something worth your time. And the stuff that I talked about today, I think, is worth your time. It's worth my time. It's not worth much, but it's it's worth something. That's all I can ask is that at least I'm getting my just worth time. So I've lost my co-host again. I guess even she got sick of listening to me. I can't imagine what you guys think. So I guess that's about it. Um, maybe I'll have somebody help me out on the next episode. I doubt it, though. The way things are going, you're probably going to get your jolly old host all by himself. And I promise you next time I won't subtly uh, quote Eminem because that's the last thing they need is a white guy rapping. Um, I don't even know if my boy T-Bone Talone listens to the show, but this, yeah, yeah. That was the Ramble On. Appreciate y'all checking in with us. With me, I should say. In Clementine. Oh, there she is. Okay, she came back. As a cat would. She goes in, she goes out. But she appreciates y'all listening. Until next time. From the Ramble On, we say so long. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.